I'm Katie Price, the project director of Rosine 2.0. Hi, my name is Carol Stakinas, and I'm the artistic director and curator of Rosine 2.0. Everything? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, one of the things I really love about this project is that that's a fundamental question of it, which is what future can we imagine together that's better than our current future? And I think it's an oversimplification, but I think you can say that some of the societal issues have arisen because people don't think collectively and they right. think individually or they think right. only about people who look like them and have a similar background as them. So I think the thing that you can do collectively is really build a better world for everyone. Right, right, right. I definitely see that too. Um, I think one of the other things that we've been exploring a lot too is um, an understanding of building community power, which means that you are not doing it alone. Uh, and like you were saying, it does mean doing something with others, some of, uh, some of whom share exactly the same experience and are very aligned. And in there other cases, it means realizing we share this community, we share this city, uh, and we want everyone to be seen and supported and heard. Um, and treated with dignity. Yeah, I agree. And um, a conversation that's come up in this project, I think several times, is the idea of community care or collective mm -hmm. care. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the people we've talked with on the project have talked about the need to recognize that everyone at different points in their lives is the one who gives care <laughs> and the one and also needs care. Mm -hmm. um, so recognizing that, I think, as a, co as a collective practice of recognizing the cycles of life and that we all yeah. need things sometimes and we can all give things sometimes. Yeah. Maybe the last thing to share um, in response to the question, which is very specific to what it's like to do um, collective creative action, and that is people have all different kinds of creative talents. And one of the things that's been always so gratifying is to really see what people bring to a project, whether it's their skill as a photographer or, um, you know, we've been doing a lot of recordings. It's been marvelous to listen and learn. And uh, that, that's built by people that have real skill in um, building connection with people and comfort uh, to be able to really share and really feel the respect that we, you know, we as the Rosine Project, Rosine 2.0, want to listen. Um, and so I, I would say that's the other thing that's a through line in the kind of work that I really love to be a part of is I don't want to do it by myself because there's so much talent and wisdom that projects like this can hold that is way beyond what I know and understand as one single person. And I've really appreciated that about your curatorial practice is just kind of recognizing, oh, this person has energy or they're excited about this idea. How can we pivot the project right. to make that happen for them? And I think right. that's made a lot, I won't say everyone <laughs> yet speak for them, but yeah. I think a lot of people in the project just feel um, welcomed in. And I think that's important yeah. in any kind of collectivity is that people feel like their perspective, their insights matter and people are interested in them. So I've really appreciated that about your curatorial practice. Oh, thanks a lot, Katie. Sure. I mean, I think one of the reasons why I was so excited when I got the email saying, hey, we're doing this work that's inspired by a 19th century Quaker activist, um, you know, thinking about how women um, can help other women. Um, I've had the honor of working on a number of different projects that look at different archives and think about how do we cross time um, in recognizing the motivations that were happening in those histories, but also how do we understand our present day. So certainly feminist histories is something that I'm interested in, and Rosine and Mira Sharpless Townsend is, has been really interesting to dive into. Um, the thing that really, Rosine 2.0 really cinched it for me was the commitment to harm reduction and especially recognizing um, the, you know, the continued reality around the opioid overdose crisis 
And uh, I have a longstanding connection and relationship to organizations that do needle exchange and sort of recognize the importance not only of those programs to literally save lives, but also recognize that as their practice, again, centering uh, the experience of those you know, who are living the moment um, and how important that is. So you know, I think that's incredibly compelling um, to be able to hold those kinds of histories. And then the third piece, which I would say I'm really excited to learn, um, are more black histories. Um, because it's certainly something that I uh, want to know more about and I'm getting a chance to work with folks in the project that can really speak to that. So. so as you were talking, I was reminded of, I think, a funny story of it was my first day of grad school. Oh, yeah? So I was 22 years old, just moved to Philadelphia. And we were going around the room saying, you know, what do you want to study? What are you here to study? And I said, the 21st century. And everyone in the room laughed at me because the 21st century was a baby <laughs> when I started grad school. Um, but I think about that moment a lot and why I'm interested, or one of the reasons I think the contemporary is so interesting mm -hmm. is because it's about how we think about our history mm -hmm. and also um, how history has brought us to this moment and also how knowing our history can change how we operate in the contemporary world in more, I think, ethical, responsible ways, if that makes sense. So in other words, I think I've always been drawn to projects that look at research as a way to live more fully into the present, if that makes sense. So as a way to understand your context, where things are coming from, right. to do the present better in a way. Right. I think I, I'm trying to think of some examples as you are talking because, you know, again, that's another theme that has come up quite a bit in the in our conversations, um, in the different configurations of people involved. Is wow, what we're encountering in the historical documents could we can find those stories uh, today, right? Um, and so part of what this also makes me think of is, uh, you know, as we're reading the case books and Mira Sharpless Townsend's um, characterization of the lives of the women that she wanted to serve, um, it makes me realize that I also have certain positionalities that I would hope would be understood as best intentions, but that for others, it would not feel that way and both recognizing the importance of um, that there will be interpretation. Just in the same way we're grappling with the interpretation of the histories of the 19th century reform movements and some of their respectability politics that you know, make me deeply uncomfortable. Um, and then I think, wow, in 50, 100, 150 years, you know, I'll, what, how are people going to see and understand the dynamics of what we have been about? And I feel like as a project, we've uh, done our best to show uh, those tensions as opposed to smoothing them out. Um, you know, because I do think that that's a really impor important part of human, you know, social relations is not everybody is thinking exactly the same way and experiencing the same thing. And, you know, how can that be a part of us knowing each other. Yeah, I really agree with that. And I think um, kind of going back to the first question about collectivity, right. um, I see history as part of that, of being in conversation with people who have come before, who have made social change, who have made right. our lives better in very tangible ways through their efforts um, and their organizing and their collective action. So I think history for me is also kind of this more inclusive or longer kind of collective. I mean, I think a future, I'm trying to remember exactly what someone said in one of the summer sessions, but we, it was in the gender justice session. Oh, and someone yeah. said like, we don't need gender, gender justice. justice. We need gender ecstasy, gender euphoria. Gender euphoria. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And I loved that. And I've actually thought about that a lot in terms of kind of taking that next step. But I think the future I imagine is one, you know, where gender doesn't dictate what you can do in the world. Okay. Um, 
you know, and I think during this project we saw like the Taliban take over Afghanistan again. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, in the United States, we're in a relatively pri privileged position. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of women in the world are still subjugated to real violence and real discrimination. Obviously, there's more than <laughs> lots of different kinds of real discrimination. Mm -hmm. um, but I just think the future I imagine is one in which anyone in the world, regardless of their gender or their sex, could be, you know, who they want to be in the world. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad that you were also reflecting on some of the conversations and kind of wisdom that emerged. And I'm thinking about when we did the Rosine School as a way of getting to know each other and the context of the history, but also the present day Philadelphia and the issues. And one of the people that was um, sharing with us was Monica Jones, um, an amazing trans black activist. And she said, why can't we just give people housing? And I think she actually repeated it at least three times. And I didn't, it didn't really sink in until I watched the recording again. But I had a moment of complete break, like something broke open of like, what is a future I can imagine? And it's a future where we can ask a question like that. And the answer is, of course we can. Yeah, I mean, I kind of have to laugh about it because you know, you have all these committees and like millions of dollars going into like, how can we solve? <laughs> solve this this housing crisis and of course they already know the answer which is to give people housing um i'm also reminded of a conversation i had with a colleague a few months ago and she said can you imagine if someone today a politician pitched the idea of public libraries like can you imagine how that would land with the public right. no one would support that um and i thought that was so interesting and i've thought about that um because these kinds of like radical social goods yeah. that would do so much for society, um, I feel like we've lost our imagination for that kind of thing, those kind of really big picture right. social infrastructures that could really change a lot of what people are able to do and what our world looks like. So I think a part of the way that I wanna try to answer the question is I feel like I've come through a certain kind of um, neoliberal training that the way I can imagine a future is through practical, you know, pragmatic, transactional, you know, capitalist systems. And if I can't think of, think of it on those terms, then it can't happen, right? And this project in particular, um, it's there's still a big gap, right? But it's kind of said, what, what happens if we just sweep that away and start with what we want, right? And uh, uh, not to paraphrase, but I know the Philadelphia Principles talks about the importance of dreaming. So that would be the other thing I would say. And it has come up in different forms of just like, that's the future, is that dreaming is a way we get to the future.